So a recent statement by the Minister of National Security, Dr. Horace Chang, has picked up feedback ranging from caution to concurrence. So we're exploring the legality of the statement and what it means for human rights consequences. Daniel Archer is the Director of National Integrity Action and Hugh Faulkner, Commissioner of the Independent Commission of Investigations. And they're both with us in studio. Morning to you both. Welcome to Smile Jamaica. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Sima and I mentioned this last week. We have, I don't know if you know, but we have what we call hot topics. And, right. and when I read the statement, I said I did not see where the minister said shoot to kill. Mm. Well, I, I guess there's an inference that that's what he meant. I'm going to start with you, sir, Mr. Faulkner. Um, but I didn't see that. Um, where in that statement did he say shoot to kill or where in that statement did he say something that meant shoot to kill? Right. Well, Neville, I would prefer to respond to the principle because, as you know, when a minister comments, then that pervades the media and the discussions in the media would take it to being um, shooting to kill. And the media itself, I believe, had given that headline. And I believe if you're expending lethal, deadly force, then death is a likely consequence. Accordingly, Indicom could not leave that debate in the public sector without comment. In other words, we have to honor the first principle in section 13.3 of the Constitution, which is the preservation okay. and the right to life. Life, having lost, cannot be returned. It is irreversible. Plus, the, the force orders of the security forces require everything to be done to preserve human life. In other words, if a citizen of Jamaica, regardless of the circumstances, gets injured, he or she is entitled to expeditious medical attention. Okay, so let me contextualize this a little bit, and then I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate, because the right to life means that our police officers should live too. Yes. And in the defense of their duties, right, if they're yes. being shot at, then somebody would say, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. let, me put a, let me contextualize it for the folks who missed the statement. Um, Minister Chang said, any, ma any time a man takes up a gun after a police officer, I, ex I expect commissioner to train them so that when in fire, he must not miss. There may be fatal shootings because man shoots guns after them. And I'm telling any policeman not to fire back. And I said it here in Westmoreland, I'm not sending any ambulance out there either. I don't want him to come give any trouble to the hospital. I'm not in that business. You go to hospital, it costs us $10 million to save him life. I'm not into that. When criminals say police come, he must surrender. Okay. Yes, miss. I know you're ready. <laughs> Go on, jump in. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Sir Portner is right, and you're also correct. It wasn't said explicitly. The NIA is concerned about the fact that you could interpret that it could be the suggestion that you're encouraging them to go outside the bounds of the rule of law. And good governance, no, and same comes to us from not just what the policy says, but to have clear, direct, precise statements so that there can be no misinterpretation. misinterpretation. So a man can say, but the minister did say that would do. And then you want to make sure, as Mr. Faulkner has said, that it aligns with the law. There is a force policy. It's the JCF Human Rights and uh, Firearms Policy. And it does state explicitly the conditions in which the police may return fire to preserve their life. And it does state explicitly that in such circumstances, anybody who is injured during such a situation is entitled to treatment. So the statements give the impression that you're saying, forget about what your force policy says and focus more now on just getting the job done. You don't really want that. That doesn't encourage good governance. And so you want to share with the public as a minister that we have a policy in place. Officers are trained, nothing is wrong with that. We support the police, as NIA has always said, we support the police defending themselves. But you must do so within the bounds of the law. That's it. So you don't want ambiguous statements. And the statement left a lot to be desired. It wasn't as precise as it should be, so as to encourage good governance. And then when you have ministers and other persons coming out saying, I stand with Minister Chang, it gives the impression, may not be so, but that he's saying something that is wrong, 
that you're saying, go out there, so do what you have to do, go around the law. And remember where we're coming from. We're coming from acid, we're coming from SWAT, we're coming from the death squad. And and we're also coming, we're also within a, a situation where we, you know, we're hearing a lot about extrajudicial killings right. and, you know, there's a lot of mistrust, Sir Faulkner. And so this, you're saying, may not have been the right um, statement, especially in a context like that, where we already have issues. Right, that is why in the com we had a duty to remind the public of what the law requires. The use of force policy of the security forces captures the circumstances of self-defense. Mm -hmm. But self-defense is not limitless. Self-defense applies while you're under attack. If the person were to surrender, then you cannot continue your assault. If the, per if the threat was to be diminished, even if the person was armed with a firearm and the threat has been diminished and you are no longer under threat, then any further action would be retaliatory mm. and not self-defense. Yep. Then you forget about excessive force. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you're doing it within the boundary of the mm. law. Uh, Mr. Faulkner, yeah. since Indicom, <laughs> how has things been as far as, uh, uh, Simone used the word extrajudicial killings, Yes. but how we have improved, for want of a better word, in that area? In fairness, I believe we have. And I must commend the former commissioner of Indicom and the staff of Indicom for the work that was done in the early days. You may recall that Michael Gale had to seek justice at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, mm -hmm. look outside of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. But since Indicom, we have an independent civilian oversight body to address these matters yep. and extrajudicial killings or the allegations have dipped from in excess of 300 to a low of 86 in 2019 but in the last few years 120 in that region yep. and we wish to see that go even lower yep. daniel um, i think I think you guys are saying, and I'm not certain we are not saying that either, that the, the minister was wrong. What should happen? Should he apologize? Should he be removed from his position? If we get to dramatic, say, you know, what should happen? There, there are a set of people, I would say, to say that he was, one is not wrong and one is not right. <laughs> as a minister, and that's one of the things NIA seeks to encourage, as a minister, you're held to a higher standard than everyone else. Even as a council, you can't take for granted certain words. You need to be precise and clear. One would hope that the minister going forward would be precise and clear in his statements and ensure that they align with the constitution and they encourage the adherence to the rule of law. An apology at this time, uh, you'd have, as Simone would well know, you'd have, it would have to be worded in such a way, it would take away from, in my personal view, this is not NIS view, but it would take away from that which has already been said. So what should happen? I think what needs to be done, respectfully, is that there has to be an encouragement of the JCF's use of force policy. They have a human rights use of force policy that speaks clearly to it, educate the officers about it, educate the public about it so that they know. It's all about education. And perhaps one of the best things to do as we are at this juncture of balancing lives is to ensure that all parties are educated as to what their rights and responsibilities are. Yeah. Do you think it's that they don't know? Or you think maybe because of the extenuating circumstances under which, you know, officers now find themselves? Because this is a different time in Jamaica. I mean, I can hear people watching now and saying, Daniel, I, I you can't go about the business here. Yeah? When the policeman did up on the front line, shot a boss and the man, the man, you know, I'm sure you get that criticism. You guys are anti-police and you, yes. you know, how do you respond to that? Well, to be fair, I can understand such sentiments, even though I consider those sentiments extreme. Mm -hmm. In a situation where there's a challenge as to high conduct of criminality and murder, you can understand a citizen saying, as you catch them, kill them. Mm -hmm. But that would run afoul of the constitution of the right to preserve life. In other words, if the circumstances continue and you face death, the law say you have to wait until you are injured. You can defend yourself. But once that threat subsides, you cannot continue to apply deadly force. Mm -hmm. That would convert your, the protection the law gave you now into a criminal act. Mm -hmm. 
The law speaks to it, Simone. A lot of what we're talking about is not something that is new or novel. The law clearly identifies the circumstances in which the policeman can respond. It clearly identifies how you can go about responding. And it clearly identifies that we owe a duty, that whenever somebody is shot or injured, that you provide assistance for them, because it is life. And that's the thing. We often speak as if we don't have the law to govern our actions. We actually do. Mm -hmm. So I agree that the situation is many of us don't know what it is. And perhaps if we did more into educating people as to their rights and responsibilities, we would have a better sense of improving yeah. our governance but level. I, I know it's tough. I mean, we, we've said this last week, it's more than four persons killed yep. every single day in Jamaica since the start of the year. Ah, not a good record to have. It's not a good record. I, ac yeah. I accept what you guys are saying, um, and I hope that, and I've said this so many times, the commission and the minister, they can't stop this. I think we have to decide as a country that we know say, there's a gun over there that shouldn't be over there, and we ball out and say, there's a gun over there that shouldn't be. And until we get there. And we stop taking the fruits yeah. of the labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good to see you both. Right. Pleasure Thank you. God bless you both. Commissioner of the Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, Mr. Hugh Faulkner, and Director of the National Integrity Action, uh, Daniel Archer. Stay with us to find out all about a spelling bee competition for senior citizens. <laughs>